Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, which is still wrapped in a pandemic, which is overheating through human transformation of the atmosphere into something uh, that will involve us for centuries to come, managing that or not managing it. Today is a big day for that. The United States House is poised to pass the bill that passed the Senate. It's uh, a sort of a down payment of $370 billion over the next 10 years to kickstart renewable and uh, nuclear and other clean energy transitions. Uh, and, and there's already, of course, a trillion dollars in the infrastructure bill. A big chunk of that is for boosting our resilience to climate hazards uh, going forward. So it's a big day on that front. Uh, this, and this is the uh, Columbia Climate School weekly Friday news review, where we step back and, and dig in a little bit on one of the topics in the news. We'll be doing more on the climate legislation going forward. Today, the focus is this group of chemicals known as PFAS, uh, to others as, as um, uh, forever chemicals. They're not alone in that category. CFCs, of course, the chlorofluorocarbons that were identified in the 70s, 80s as a threat to the uh, ozone layer. They're also very enduring compounds that don't exist in nature. But the distinction here with PFAS, with the, this, this collection of fluorinated uh, polymers, is not only do they last a long time once they're generated and get into the environment and into us, they, they uh, pose risks. They're, some of those risks are still uncertain. Some of them are identified through statistical you know, epidemiological analysis, some through animal models. It's still hard to find a direct imprint of the, you know, the, the harm in, in humans, but the idea that they're around for a long time is, is how that relates to how we treat them as risks is, is, is the, it's a, one of the focuses here. I'm glad that one of the authors of the new paper digging in on that is with us. And the paper had this pretty profound conclusion. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, just so you get an idea of who's here, um, uh, Dr. Martin Scheringer from uh, ETH Zurich, which I don't know if it's fair to say you're like the MIT of Europe even, <laughs> but maybe better even. <laughs> so I don't want to say, you know, but in the category of MIT, very, very, very uh, uh, high level university um, and especially with a focus on engineering technology. Uh, and he's an author of this new paper we'll talk about. Uh, Garrett Ellison from Michigan Live, who is a regional journalist who is focusing on PFAS questions from the community level, you know, how they relate to the area in Michigan, the Great Lakes and uh, going forward. Carol Kwiatkowski is a science and policy senior associate at Green Science Policy Institute. We'll learn more about her work. Uh, Eric Heck is at uh, UCLA. He's an inventor and a uh, scientist deeply dug in on water contamination and what do you do about it, uh, which I think is a very important question. I'm not sure, but I think David Ropik, an old friend who's a master of risk communication, who wrote this, the, uh, an essential book called How Risky Is It Really? Uh, maybe on later, we'll find out. But um, so let's just get on to it. And thank you all for coming. You know, you'll get to your, your moment in a second. The paper uh, is outside the safe operating space of a new planetary boundary for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. This is PFAS, these molecules, these polymers uh, with fluorine atoms, with that fluorine carbon bond making them so durable. And one of the findings was if you look at rainfall anywhere in the world, basically under a new EPA advisory level, the rain is contaminated and not safe in that context. Uh, the press release uh, was pretty provocative. It's, it's raining PFAS even in Antarctica and on the Tibetan plateau, rainwater is unsafe to drink. So uh, maybe uh, Martin, uh, if you could unmute, we'll get you to just uh, offer some, you know, how did you all come together on this? You, you were involved with a, a lot of efforts related to safety around chemistry. Um, what prompted this particular lens on the question? Yeah, thank you, Andy, and hello, everyone. My name is Martin Schellinger, as Andy said. I work in Switzerland at the ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And I appreciate your interest and the possibility that I can share some insights here with you. 
Uh, my background is I'm a chemist and I have always been interested in chemicals that don't do chemistry in the environment in a way. So chemicals that don't degrade, they don't re do undergo lots of reactions, but they are stable, persistent. Mm. And that makes them, gives them a lot of time to travel around the world, to spread globally, and also then to cause effects in, in wildlife and humans. So I have seen persistence as a key characteristic of problematic chemicals for, I think, 30 years now. And I have done a lot of work on POPs, persistent organic pollutants. There is the so-called Stockholm Convention on POPs, where these chemicals are regulated globally. And I've been an expert in the context of that convention. And I've done quite some work on PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, that are also persistent chemicals that have spread globally. And then since, I think, 2008, Ian and I have collaborated on PFAS, Ian Cousins mm -hmm. and I, uh, on human exposure to PFAS, but also then on the properties, uses, emissions, and of course, also what we call the environmental fate of these chemicals. Right. So that's my pathway and to this paper. And because we have been in these discussions about PFAS and levels and where is this all going, we, we had this idea, we looked into these levels, and then Ian has always been interested in this question of decreasing health guidance, guidance values. And, and there has been this observation that they go down and down and down and down. And then at some point, of course, they are so low that they are close to or even below the levels we actually see in the environment. And that's the point we have or, reached. Or even the level you can detect, right? So yeah, unless that's, you yeah. have some really, really costly instruments yeah but there has been a lot of progress on that side so we can really measure lower and lower levels now we may not be able to exactly measure the levels that these health advisories um, now mention but still we can go down quite quite a bit and we can see pfas uh, much more clearly now in the global environment than let's say 10 years ago mm -hmm. yeah. so that's my background on my 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 journey to this point yeah. this paper and and we'll we'll have these intersecting lines of each each journey uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, one of the points in the paper that really uh, I think about a lot is the this idea of planetary boundaries. Uh, Johann Rockström and others in uh, Stockholm and elsewhere had come up with this concept of nine kinds of boundaries that we're sort of transgressing a couple of them already. Uh, I've written about this quite often, and uh, you know, there's been interesting not pushback de debate about how you measure it, how you determine what's safe or not safe. We'll talk more about that word safe in, in a minute. Uh, but here's just a bit of an illustration I pulled together on there's this novel entities planetary boundary bundle and your paper proposes essentially that this PFAS family of compounds lie within there. Yeah. Yeah, the point here was in a way that we have also, we as a team and also with others, we have been discussing this concept as well, of course, because it's provocative, but it's also comprehensive and it's a it's a vehicle for this kind of message somehow that we are reaching many limits within many of our activities. And we found in earlier discussion, in earlier discussions, that it is very hard to even conceptualize or quantify this boundary for novel entities. And that's why we thought now, okay, it would be much, it would make a lot of sense to, to break it down, to narrow it and name a specific type of chemicals for which we can actually evaluate where we are much more than a diffuse large number of chemicals that causes, uh, cause a lot of different types of effects. We really don't know where we are. We may have crossed the boundary for some, in some cases, but not in others. It's from local to global and that is very difficult to, to quantify. So we are we think it's much more productive in a way, or just uh, useful to speak about a specific selection of chemicals where we can talk about this boundary. Yeah, um, and this has gotten a lot of uh, pickup. There's this tool on a lot of paper research uh, journal websites called Altimetric, and you can see here, uh, I think that's Russian. There, there's it's, it's all over the place, the story for obvious reasons. It's, uh, Again, it's a provocative idea. Some of this has kicked back, and this will take us to the communication question. Uh, uh, this tweet I just saw this morning, the South African news site, uh, the headline is never drink rainwater. Study finds unsafe to drink due, due to chemicals. I literally just saw this tweet uh, an hour ago. And 
uh, I went to the um, the the, uh, the the news story is actually by Agence France Press. You know, this is not some flaky story. The the presentation is to me very problematic. Uh, this is a lot of us journalists. We always say, well, we didn't write the headlines. I think we need to pay more attention to headlines. So so is it. And I guess this. Let's bring in uh, Carol and and Garrett and Eric now, just to talk about the interface between science and the public. You know, it's it's hard to get attention, and yet then to still hew to what we know and don't know. Uh, Carol, uh, you know, you work. Could you tell us a little bit about the 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 Green Alliance group that you work at, and you know how you think about this from your standpoint? Sure. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm a senior associate at the Green Science Policy Institute. I also have an adjunct assistant professor at North Carolina State University. And uh, I'm a health scientist. And so I tend to focus on um, that uh, I have in my career looked at the um, health research around toxic chemical in the environment. The first PFAS research that I worked on was in 2017 when I was the director of a scientific nonprofit called the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, where we looked at the impact of environmental chemicals on our hormones specifically. And I, um, as part of the team there, I co-created the PFAS TOS database, which is an online resource that um, organizes all the health effects research on specifically on 29 different PFAS. And the, the point there is to make the scientific research accessible to people. It's online, it's available to anybody. You can see the studies that have been done on these 29 PFAS, which are the most studied of all of them. And um, there's about a thousand different studies on there and they range from hundreds of studies for some PFAS down to just a less than a dozen for others. Um, and um, that database lets you look at trends and data gaps and data clusters. And, and so people can understand better what the health effects of PFAS are. Um, <clears throat> the uh, at the Green Science Policy Institute, which I joined in 2020, um, they've been working on PFAS for over a decade and also provide a lot of resources for the public. So in addition to the website for Green Science Policy, um, there's a, a website called PFAS Central, which, which hosts the latest science, news and policy on PFAS. So you can always go there and see what's been published recently. Um, and we have a website called sixclasses.org, which has um, has a lot of information, but also these little four minute videos, which are really helpful for the public um, on six different chemical classes of concern, including PFAS. And this is what we like to promote. There's the class concept um, <clears throat> that you've got on the screen there. And, and the, the main point around promoting the class concept is that what often happens is that when, um, and we've seen this with PFAS, when these chemicals that we first learn about ha having a lot of problems, whether they're with things like um, uh, environmental problems or, or human health problems, and they get either restricted or in the case of um, PFOA and PFOS, which are the two most researched PFAS, um, there was a voluntary withdrawal of those chemicals. <clears throat> then their replacements come out and they're um, often just as harmful, but it takes another decade to study them and find out that they're they're problematic as well. And so when we know about a particular class of chemicals and can identify, um, as Martin has said, that, that persistence is an example of something that, that applies to the entire class of PFAS. And on that basis of a, alone, we have to find ways to manage all PFAS at, at once and not, and not be doing it one at a time. So um, I just launched into that because you put it up on the screen. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but but in a way that gets to one of the uh, the industry points on this. They feel uh, exactly. They have another argument that's along the lines of a class concept. They you know they say this 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 group of chemical compounds can't be lumped together. They, they're some are liquids, some are gases, some are solids. They they have a completely different range of, of properties. Uh, so it's uh, not fair and actually not doesn't hew with the United States regulate, regulatory process to do that. So I don't know if this is a good time. I was going to talk about that in a minute, but maybe we could briefly uh, get at that too. Well, and, well, and that is exactly the problem is that you can't lump them together for risk assessment. Risk assessment is the way that the, the, the current chemicals assessment process um, and management process 
And you, you can't do a risk assessment on, on all 12,000 PFAS. You know, you could create groups, but even the groups would be large for different kinds of PFAS. And so what this says is that we need an entirely new way of addressing large classes like this. And um, I don't want to uh, take any credit for Martin's work. Um, he and his group have really um, pushed this new approach called uh, essential uses. And we've been, mm -hmm. we've been doing the same thing that there, there needs to be, um, that we need to look at the uses of large classes of chemicals like this and say which uses are essential um, and which uses are not essential. And those that are not essential need to be removed immediately and then try to find safer alternatives for the essential ones because this is how you can the entire class at once, which you can do with risk assessment. I won't go into it too much right now because you said you want to talk about it later, but it's just a well, top level look at it. But yeah, maybe we will make a quick round of, and we'll introduce Eric and, and Garrett and then we'll keep going. Uh, so Eric, uh, you're at UCLA. Again, you have a very uh, interdisciplinary approach here, I think, as far as I can tell from your, your research. Uh, can you just introduce yourself a little bit? And when you think about PFAS or other water issues, uh, as we head toward 9 billion people who all have to drink every day, what drives you crazy or, or seems like the opportunity you're trying to pursue? Hmm. Well, there's, um, so first of all, I'm an engineering professor at UCLA and um, mainly focused on water treatment technologies, their application. Uh, P PFAS is a class of compounds, these per and polyfluoro alkyl substances that because of the, their structure on uh, their surfactant like, which means on one end they carry a charge, which allows them to be dissolved in water. On the other end, they have a fluorinated hydrocarbon chain, which is hydrophobic and sticky. And so they both um, are stable in water, for example, uh, but they also can stick to things. They can partition into fatty tissues and bioaccumulate. Um, they are actually quite easy to remove from water, uh, but in the process of removing them or any of the available commercial, you know, commercially proven technologies, they inevitably turn the original problem into a different problem, right? Because there's no, no current way um, that's been widely tested and demonstrated or accepted to destroy these chemicals. We can only separate them from water and uh, onto a solid substance or concentrate them up and, and purify, you know, a portion of the water. Uh, but you inevitably end up with a waste which is a more has a more concentrated uh, uh, amount uh, uh, of these compounds. And so then what do you do with that, right? You can't just put it in a landfill. It's going to get back in the water, uh, uh, you know, in the air and so on. The other thing that's happened over the years is the, you know, the early work, I think Carol alluded to this, you know, said that the compounds that have eight carbon atoms you know, were, were very bad. And so the initial solution, you know, by the chemical companies was, okay, well, if you're going to ban C8, we'll make C6. And if you're going to ban C6, we'll make C4, right? They're just shortening that hydrocarbon tail. Mm -hmm. And once you get down to C4, not only are these compounds labile in water, uh, you know, they stick to things, they bioaccumulate, but they're also, then they also become semi-volatile. So now you can have the compounds moving from different phases, from solid to gas phase, from water to, to the air, uh, for example. So it, it seems like anything we do to try to, um, to treat or remediate or modify only makes the problem worse. So that sounds different. Well, maybe I shouldn't say different than CFCs. You know, when I was writing about ozone depletion, DuPont and others, very early on had identified substitutes uh, that could be adopted for refrigerants and everything to to get us out of that fix. Uh, th there are climate impacts to some of those, but this feels like it. So this seems chemically harder. Maybe uh, Martin, you could chime in on that too. Yeah, I defer to the chemist. <laughs> <laughs> No, not much to add. I would agree that they are really difficult to, to handle. And 
it will be at least very expensive and a lot of effort to remove them from a certain, let's say, amount of water. But the water pollution has reached a dimension that is so beyond of what I, can, I think can be treated technically that 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 we are even, yeah, it's even worse in a way. We will have to accept somehow uh, that the PFAS will be in lots of the water bodies for many people, and we will have to find a way to, to still avoid or reduce or minimize exposure. But that's, yeah, we may go back a bit more into this discussion of what I would call the, the footprint. There's really a big footprint of these chemicals everywhere in the world, and, and people feel that footprint somehow. And that's something I think I, I would like to further discuss later on in the discussion here. Yeah, so now let's bring in Garrett, who, through his reporting, is very focused on, you know, what the average person, the average community, uh, the, their decision makers, their regional and state uh, health uh, folks and their neighbors, how they grasp, grapple with uh, something like this. So Garrett, what drew you could be reporting on sports or the stock market or, you know, cool, fun science. Uh, what got you this mess? Uh, well, I, I've been covering environmental uh, issues in Michigan since about 2015, 20, 2014, 2015, and um, toxics are part of that. And uh, I started um, paying attention to the issues around an Air Force base up in northern Michigan, a community called Oscoda on the shore of Lake Huron. And um, it's really one of the very first places that uh, the compounds were ever uh, discovered at a military facility in, in, in the United States, and it's called Wurtsmith Air Force Base. It was like a B-52 bomber strategic air command base. Um, and it's very typical of, um, you know, the military's problem with this stuff where they used the AFFF firefighting foam for, for years. They developed it after the uh, aircraft carrier fire, and they just, they trained with it liberally. They used it on crashes and, and so on. And now it's, uh, an enormous problem. And, um, and so it was about 2016 that I started paying, paying attention to that, decided to start following it, talking to, um, some state regulators in Michigan who were kind of ahead of the curve in, in, in a big way. Um, in terms of recognizing the severity of the problem, the potential for it to be widespread um, across the state of Michigan, which has a, you know, a, a really big manufacturing history. Um, and, you know, the, in that in that effort, in that attempt, in a, uh, writing about that, I came into contact with people in the city of uh, Rockford, uh, which is north of Grand Rapids, and that's the mm -hmm home community of uh, Wolverine Worldwide, uh, the footwear company um, mm -hmm. behind uh, a lot of a lot of shoe brands that people are familiar with, Mary, Sper uh, Merrill, Sperry, um, mm -hmm. Jocko. And uh, we, you know, and the people in that community, some, some very uh, diligent um, activists over a period of about 10 years amassed enough evidence of the Wolverine company's uh, um, dumping practices, um, you know, with its, uh, at a tannery that had operated in Rockford for like a century, um, that they were able to force the state of Michigan to start looking around, looking into uh, testing um, around an old landfill that everybody had forgotten about. It was just regulators, everyone had forgotten this thing even existed. And it ended up becoming the most severe example of PFAS contamination in Michigan, right? It, yeah, that's the map of it right there. It's a 25 square mile, multiple plumes moving at different directions at different depths within, you know, um, the substrata, um, you know, contamination levels in people's drinking water at like 80,000 parts per trillion, uh, just, just ungodly high uh, amounts. Uh, very, very unsafe. Um, and, you know, it, through that, I spent about two years um, between 2017, 2018 into 2019, writing almost about, about almost nothing else uh, mm -hmm. besides PFAS in Michigan. And, you know, the Wolverine contamination launched the state of Michigan's effort to find it in drinking water communities all over the state. Uh, they did. They found a really severe example in, in Parchment near Kalamazoo, which is actually a community that I later moved to and I live in now. Wow. 
Um, and so, yeah, I've spent a lot of time um, sort of on the ground at various communities in Michigan trying to understand the, you know, the layout of the contamination, how it happened, how it's affected people, and, uh, you know, kind of carry that stuff into reporting on the policy uh, efforts at the state level, um, how that's impacted what's going on nationally, and, and so on. Wow. And, and, you know, I was looking at that, that tweet from back then, that was 890 times the EPA advisory level at that time. Yeah, yeah, the and, previous and, and in June, it just went down by orders of magnitude, which is the, the figure that is in Martin's paper. Uh, I think it's like 0.04 parts per trillion. Well, parts, yeah, or it's at the like parts per quadrillion level. I, I you know, it's, right. it's like I, I think you mentioned it earlier, but it's it's, it's essentially it's essentially zero, right? I mean, it's below right. um, what labs are, most labs uh, are able to detect, right? right? I think the reporting limit for uh, these compounds in most lab reports that I've seen are two parts per trillion, right? And so this is way orders of magnitude below that. Um, and so it's, you know, this summer when the EPA adjusted those uh, downward using... Uh, studies, uh, you know, epi, epi studies that actually look at the effect of these chemicals in, in people, not in lab animals, you know, lo and behold, <laughs> suddenly this stuff is a lot more toxic. And it's one of those things that, you know, reporting on this for so long, it was like, yeah, well, finally that happened. You know, we were expect <laughs> we've been expecting it for so long. I mean, I just remember sitting, you, you know, sitting in uh, various community meetings around the state of Michigan, listening to the, the local, uh, well, the state health department toxicologist, uh, you know, going, you know, at length about how 70 parts per trillion is very health protective. And we're very confident in that, you know, and it was like, uh, you know, even back then, this is in 2018, I'm listening to all these meetings and I'm like, well, you know, there's a there's a lot of credible research out there that suggests that's not the case. Um, you know, there's um, there there was a, a, a level suggested through Philip Philippa Granjan's uh, research that was like it's one part per trillion is probably you know the safe level, and you would say that to regulators and health officials, and they would, well, it's not regulatory, you know, and, and there's, the science is still evolving, and, and, you know, we can't tell people that, and, um, and, and so it's always been a little, it's been a, a difficult thing to convey through, you know, journalism and news reporting uh, that, you know, what the health officials are saying to you, and this is in 2018, um, is, yeah, take it with a grain of salt uh, mm -hmm. to some degree on this stuff, which is difficult in and in of itself because now you're sort of suggesting and planning this idea that, um, you know, they're, you, you know, what the health department is telling you is, is not necessarily accurate. And I started to, you know, when COVID came around and everything is uh, suddenly people are disbelieving the COVID guidance and stuff, I started to be like, oh man, you know, this sounds... You know, you, you, I've been in this case where I've been kind of suggesting, gosh, you know, this uh, official safety guidance on these chemicals is sort of uh, a little wishy-washy here. And, and, and now we have this thing going on with the pandemic. And it just started to seem very, I started to just see a lot of similarities there. I guess I'm going off on a tangent a little bit, but. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's tangential at all. I'm sure everyone here would agree. Uh, Eric, you had a thought. Yeah, I'll make the point that uh, a lot of times, at least in the U.S., um, EPA typically leads, uh, if not a state like California or New York or sometimes Michigan, bigger states with more resources. They lead on um, setting contaminant levels. And what we talk about in drinking water, for example, maximum contaminant levels are levels not necessarily that are deemed safe for human consumption over a lifetime but those aren't the health limits those are the legally allowable or permissible limits that can be in a drinking water um, an older example going back about 20 30 years arsenic um, the health studies the epidemiological studies suggested that three parts per billion 
is the maximum that a human should be exposed to to minimize risk. But when they estimated the cost of retrofitting all of the drinking water treatment plants in the U.S. that would have to be retrofitted, it was in the billions. It was astronomical right. and unachievable. And so then they went through the analysis again, and they got to 10 parts per billion was a level that could be achieved with a reasonable amount of investment to, to retrofit and improve the, the, the treatment plants. So there's often a kind of a compromise like that. And it's, I'm not advocating for it or against it. I'm just saying the reality is that even the contaminant levels that have to be reported on that have that, that action has to be taken on, they aren't often as low as you would hope they would be based on the, the health studies. And then the, the other piece is, and that several people have said something to this effect, uh, that there's what we can detect and there's what we cannot detect based on the state of the art analytical instrumentation. <clears throat> In the state of California, you know, there's sort of the rumor mill, if you will, is that they were going to set PFOS and PFOA levels to one part per trillion. But there was only one laboratory in the state that could make that measurement accurately and reproducibly. And they're, they can't create a, a monopoly situation. So they had to raise it to a level where there were at least two or three labs that could be uh, certified uh, for testing. So again, there are these compromises which, which often exist that have nothing to do with health, have nothing to do with intention, uh, but, but just constraints that um, you know, can't be avoided. So, so I, I think some, maybe Martin wants to make a point, but um, to me, this gets me in a practical sense, thinking again toward the point of use, point of contact, part of the risk assessment. You know, if we have an issue where there's ubiquity, persistence, probable risk at low levels that are costly to measure, put a filter on with a high confidence of taking it out and make sure there's a just and equitable process for getting those filters into low income households and the like, or to focus on people at higher risk. I know like with most the PCBs, which I wrote about back way back in the 20th century, um, you know, it was PCBs and fish, they targeted women, indigenous groups that had a higher consumption of fish or women during pregnancy. So, and that gets that gets us back to Eric's, Eric's work too, but you know, what are we expecting here? Uh, if we use this traditional set of thre a threshold for below which you know there's no hazard. Maybe, maybe Martin first. Yeah, if I may, thank you. Yeah. Um, what you just said, Eric, of course, is all part of the problem and part of the discussion. But I would like to perhaps change the lens a bit or make it a bit wider. And sure. I think because we don't really know exactly, as you said, Eric, we don't really know what exactly this means very specifically. But I think what we can say now with the paper that we have published, what that means, that is more or less that these chemicals are visible. We can measure them. We can see them with the techniques we have and the levels we see are relevant. That's what it means. They are close enough, at least, to some uh, values that may matter for health, for human health. And the rainwater levels are just the very low ones. But of, as I said earlier, there are many water bodies that are contaminated at much higher levels. So overall, we do have a lot of people who are exposed to irrelevant, let's call them, relevant levels of PFAS for a long time. And that's, I think, what we have to face. And we should perhaps not not um, get bogged down into discussions about what exactly now is the substance of a certain value or a proposal by someone here or someone there, because there would always be that range and that, that uncertainty in the discussion. But I think it's, it's clear and undeniable in a way that we see PFAS more or less everywhere in the world and we see them at levels that are relevant. Yeah, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, I had to argue with my wife to get rid of Teflon pots and pans in the house and we have water filtration in our house. Don't let the kids drink the tap water. Uh, tap water is generally good, right? But I read your paper, Martin, and it, it's absolutely frightening. I mean, it's great science, uh, but it is, it's horrifying to, to think that there's nothing you can do to protect yourself from exposure to these chemicals at this point. So Carol, uh, you know, again, you clearly function at the um, active interface trying to generate change to reduce risk. Um, both by working on what industry 
you know, defrocking industries claims and, uh, and then uh, presenting information that can, can uh, produce results. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, the EPA, I think this fall, if, unless it's been delayed, is planning to move from advisory to regula regulation on at least a couple of the ca compounds. Uh, is that, you know, how, how do you gauge progress? Is that part of it? Oh, you're, you're, you're um, muted. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to make a, a relevant point, and it also speaks to what Garrett was saying about uh, public health agencies and their uh, advice being, you know, less than helpful. And I think that they're always balancing that um, panic that they might cause by suggesting something like, you know, what people are fearful of now with the EPA levels having been lowered, you know, that we're all at risk and what we do about it. And then that there may be no guidance yet on what we can do about it. And I think it's it's really apropos that uh, a National Academies of Sciences report just came out that was looking at um, and trying to bridge that gap between public health and clinical guidance in the medical community and how can we help people who have been highly exposed um, and are concerned about their levels and what can we do about it. And they have some very specific guidance with with measurable levels of PFAS in people's blood to say what should they be doing in, in concert with their um, physicians and their medical practitioners to deal with this. And so um, if, if people and about supposedly about 10% of the US population is above this level, have 20 or more nanograms per milliliter of PFAS in their blood um, serum or plasma, that they should be getting um, regularly screened with lipid panels and thyroid tests and cancer screenings and things that are all uh, warning signs for um, some of the health effects that have substantial evidence to confirm that they're associated with PFAS. So I think it's really helpful now that this has come out right now when we're um, when the conversation is being elevated around levels that are safe and not safe and it being found in rainwater and that it needs to be paired with something that people can do about it. Um, that said, there's this, the other side of it, which I think Andy was alluding to, which is the work on the, um, that we do at Green Science Policy, which is um, focusing on working with companies to try to educate them so that they can learn how to remove PFAS from the products that they use and sell. So that gets back to- I'm gonna Martin. pause there. Sorry. Yeah, well, Martin, in, in an email exchange we had, and I think maybe not in this paper, but in other work, um, a key thing here is the whole design process, moving, moving back from the end of the pipeline where stuff gets into the environment to the very fundamental aspects of how industry and government and consumers together process what we need and how to fill that gap. And I, I, you know, green chemistry was a term of art that came up at least 15 years ago, I think. Is, is that getting into the gestalt and the industries at the scale that matters or, or not? I, I think not, re not really, not yet, let's say, but, but we don't even need a very high level of sophisticated green chemistry because here the, the, the thing would be relatively simple to avoid organofluorine substances in consumer products. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a very simple rule. <laughs> and and that, we may call that green chemistry, but that's very obvious in a way that this is the problem here in this case, and that's a big problem already. So even without talking about green chemistry and designing new products uh, in general, I think we can really focus on that point that organofluorine chemicals are a problem because they are so stable and that's clearly known, has been known, known for, for 50, 60 years or more. And that the, con the consequence just has to be that, that these chemicals may be used. I mean, Carol mentioned that the essential use concept, they may be used in, in uses that are really very important, but there should be closed uses and or as far as possible. And they should not be used in, in hundreds and thousands of consumer products that people use openly in their daily lives. That is just totally not right. 
And that would have been easy to avoid at the beginning. Now, of course, not. We are now too late for that. But that's a simple thing, I would say. And and my, concept, my the implication of this is really that we have to change that way of of making something and it's super convenient, it's powerful, let's use it wherever we can. That's just not the way to go. <laughs> That's and even in the situation we know what the what the what the downside is, because we the people knew very early on that they are very persistent. Yeah, so I asked uh, the American Chemistry Council if someone could come on. Uh, I did ask them fairly yesterday, so it was kind of just came together quickly and they couldn't pull together somebody. Uh, they've been writing a lot about this their point about classification feels to me potentially valid, but some things that they do seem pretty well. Let me just show you. They keep making this point. PFAS. Yeah. They call it. They call it fluorotechnology. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, and it enables life in the 21st century. This is not old. This reminds me of, of Monsanto in the 60s. The, the, chem, the chemical, you know, chemistry, it's what makes chemicals, it's what makes life possible. It's just the same kind of yeah. presentation. So, anyway, so how, how, how essential are some of these compounds? And, and I'd like to, to hear from a couple of you too. Yeah, no, if it may directly, this, I, I think I would call this propaganda because that is not true. Oh, yeah. uh, that's just not true. Of course, they, they say it like this because these chemicals have, in many cases, the highest possible performance for something. Mm -hmm. And if you want to stick with that performance and want to defend that level of performance, then you, of course, you have to say these chemicals are essential and that they are the only ones that offer this performance and enable all the, the fantastic things you can do. That is kind, that is kind of true. Mm -hmm. But we may do with a little less performance and still maybe perfectly fine. For example, ski racks. There are ski racks with and without PFAS. And if your skis glide a bit faster or not, that doesn't matter at all. So that little little difference in performance is not a justification for the huge, huge environmental impact and footprint that yeah. would be then the cost of that. That's very, I think, totally obvious. So this gets to Carol's point. If if you if you look at risks, uh, if you sort of boost the 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 value, meaning the importance of persistence in how a decision is made about a compound. So not just like the hazard exposure is that a key to that would just sort of immediately make this whole group of compounds tamp it down in terms of how uh, industry and, and the government thinks about it and carol you're muted sorry oh sorry i didn't realize you were asking me the question but yeah that that is a, a valid point and i think it's important to remember too that a lot of companies don't even know that they're using PFAS in their products. You know, supply chains are really complex and it's even hard when they do want to find out for them to be able to find out from chemical manufacturers. And there's a really good example of a shoe company, Keen Shoes, that um, made the effort, made a commitment to get rid of all fluorochemicals. And of the 100 uses of PFAS in their um, waterproof shoes, they found that 70 of them were not even essential, necessary to them. They didn't need that performance. And so they could very quickly get rid of those. And then it took them several years to focus on the ones that were essential and find safer alternatives. And that's really that's a really good example of how the essential use approach works. And that's the, the crux of what um, you know we'd like to see happen. And mm. uh, other companies are taking on this effort too, particularly brands. And that points to the power of the consumer. If people start becoming aware of this and can start demanding that companies stop using um, fluorochemicals, then the companies themselves will respond, which can sometimes happen quicker than, often happens quicker than government response. Yeah, so that feels really important. Um, sorry that their pop-up ads are coming. But Keen uh, had put a big push on this. And I assume, you know, for the informed consumer, this can lead to sort of to create a virtuous cycle of uh, yeah. change. Uh, and I, I've seen that need so many times. It's good to see a company the size of Keen do this because I remember years ago, I was at a meeting in Washington on sustainability and business and a, a high level guy at Nike was on stage and I asked him, I said, you know, there are these small guitar makers like 
tailor guitars that now get their wood for their guitars from a, a supply chain that they actually control. They know the wood is harvested sustainability. What, how does that relate to like the shoe business? And he said, he said, when we do marketing, we've done marketing, all we do it all the time. When we market a shoe as sustainable, people actually see it as less good, <laughs> meaning there's a compromise of some sort. That gets back to what uh, Martin was saying about ski wax. So, and I guess that also gets to even the sustainability challenge around energy, you know, as, as solar and renewables and uh, the like gets so cheap that it's, it's sort of not seen as a compromise. You start to see change like we're seeing now, but I want to get um, the voice of the, the common person back in the room in the sense of Garrett, you know, dealing with at the state and community scale uh, are people mostly you know, there where you have these pulses of exposure and the like, it's kind of gets it to the level of someone help me right now. It, it relates, it reminds me, of course, of Flint, Michigan with, with lead. Uh, you know, I need safe water now for my family and uh, all this cosmic global stuff can wait. So, or is that, is that the way the story's playing out on the ground? Well, you know, Michigan's a little uh, ahead of a lot of places in terms of, you know, that story has been playing out for a few years. Uh, you know, the state really started looking for this stuff. And so the, the in 2018, right? And so the public in Michigan anyway has, and, and, and to some degree that the Great Lakes region, right? Because the states sort of affect the other ones around. Um, and so the, the, there's a little bit more of an educated public here in Michigan than, than there is in, in some other states, um, just because we've been dealing with it. It's been in the news. It's, you know, the, you know, every community has had its water. Every, every place that serves more than 25 people, you know, with water has, you know, is now subject to enforceable state standards that were passed in 2020. Um, which are now out of sort of out of date, you know, in, in relation to the new EPA ad, uh, advisory levels. Um, but, you know, we are still, it, it, it plays out in so many different ways, particularly among, among the public, you know, you get people who uh, are still don't know about it, right? You know, you, you, you're in conversation, casual conversation with folks who are like, uh, what do you do? You know, oh, environment reporter, I write a lot about PFAS. Oh, I've heard about that. And it's like, oh yeah, it's like in your makeup and it's in your, you know, if you eat fast food, it's on that, on those, you know, um, food contact paper, it's your pizza boxes. And then they're just start to, you know, kind of like, oh my God, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's in a lot of drinking water too. And now we're starting to find it in food in a pretty big degree. And then just eyes start to kind of like uh, bug out a little bit. And then you become that person who's like, okay, well, uh, there's a lot of bad news coming out of this guy. We'll talk to someone else. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, th there's, I want to tell you a story here. There's an interesting thing happening in Michigan right now around a river uh, in Southeast Michigan called the Huron river uh, where there was actually a, a, a spill, um, you know, occurred in the last couple of weeks and it wasn't PFAS. It was hexavalent chromium, right? The Aaron Brockovich uh, chemical. Um, and this it's by a, this, the company that caused the spill is, the same company that has caused the city of Ann Arbor's drinking water uh, treatment plant all kinds of grief because they draw, Ann Arbor draws a lot of its water from the Huron River and it's been polluted with PFAS for years and years. And it comes from this one plating company uh, by and large, which now has that you now has another toxic spill. Um, and so just this morning, I'm on the phone with, uh, um, yep, that's it, uh, regulators with the state of Michigan, and I'm trying to get back on top of like, okay, so we, we've been writing a lot about the hex chrome spill. You know, people are upset, very upset about this company because it's like the second time, you know, they are beating this river up. Um, and, you know, what's the history, what exactly is the violation history related to PFAS? And, um you know, it's, it's a plating company, right? They, they, they plate, uh, you know, they dunk uh, plastic pieces in, in chromium and in order to coat, decorate, uh, coat them with uh, decorative chrome as, you know, for, as part of their auto supply uh, business. 
and they use PFAS to as fume suppressants, right? And that's what they, um, you know, to protect people, right? And so it's this this discussion around uh, essential uses. It's it is interesting to me because you know, and I had to confirm with the state, like, yeah, they aren't using PFOS anymore because that's you know phased out. Mm -hmm. Now they're mm -hmm. using a, a replacement called six two FTS. Uh, which doesn't even sound like a PFAS compound to people who aren't, you know, familiar with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the state's going, yeah, we think this is passing through the wa uh, the wastewater treatment plant into the river, but because it's not a regulated compound, we don't have criteria for it. And wow. it's just one of these examples of the substitute, um, you know, the, the, the laws and the rules and all of the, you know, fail safes are not catching up to the substitute that's now being used by this company. Um, and so it's, 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 it all kind of goes to show that like, it's such a rabbit hole uh, with mm -hmm. this stuff. Um, and that's kind of the way I try to, you know, like explain it to, to regular people, um, is just like, you, you know, they, they start talking about it with me and I'm like, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go with this? Right. Cause, <laughs> um, I guarantee you're going to be, be kind of freaked out a little bit, uh, if we keep talking here because you're, you've been exposed to it. We've all got it in our blood and it, 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 it's hard for people to wrap their minds around it. Like, especially, you know, people who are realize they learn that they've gone through a high exposure. Right. Like uh, my well was contaminated or my drinking water supply was highly contaminated. I'm now part of an investigation. And that's happened to a lot of people in Michigan. And there's like this stages of a grieving process that they that they almost go through. And that's very much what it seems like. There's this denial. And then there's this, uh, you know, OK, I'm starting to you know, frantic research, finding people, somebody to explain this to me. And it's getting better, you know, in terms of finding resources for people to understand it, you know, because there is, it's, it's not as co uh, completely unknown as it, as it was, you know, even a few years ago. Um, but it, that, that there are still people in Michigan and, and, and definitely in other States that are going through that process. And it's, it, you know, it resources like, um, you know, green, um, uh, science, Pol uh, the Policy Institute that uh, Carol's at, you know, they they do those sorts of things like the, the database she was talking about earlier, that stuff ends up being very helpful, um, you know, to journalists and, you know, it, it, the general public that ends up finding it, you know, I think we do need a lot more of that sort of thing, you know, definitely science oriented co um, communications that are geared towards regular people as much as possible. Right. And maybe, uh, Eric, I want to bring you in here, too, just because we're also talking about how to secure um, the drinking tap, the tap water end of things. Uh, this, while this plays out, given the realities that we're not going to instantly get the industry to completely stop generating more of these compounds, when there's a lag time there, just like there's a lag time with the compounds in the environment and in our bodies there's inertia and regulatory change. It's taken 30 years to get the bill that's being signed today on global warming, $370 billion with no regulatory component, which was the only reason it got signed. So, you know, I've been writing about global warming since the 1980s. So, wow, yay. But so, so what, what's the role of technology here um, in the meantime? You know, is there a way to secure uh, at the drinking water end of things not just rushing into a community like Flint or like those communities we just heard about that are already in a state of emergency. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a advocate for point of use water filtration, which means some form of water filtration either under your sink uh, with a separate tap that's got the filtered water uh, in your refrigerator or countertop uh, pitcher or something like that. Um, Everything comes with a compromise. Uh, so, for example, uh, thank you. It's a review article that we published a few years ago. Um, essentially, 
there are three technologies that can remove PFAS from drinking water. There's activated carbon, there are ion exchange resins uh, targeting anions, which the end of the PFAS compound is an anion, negatively charged ion, and reverse osmosis. Okay. RO does the best job of assuring you know, nearly complete removal, 99% plus. Now, depending on what you have, 99% sounds good, but it might not get you to where you need to be. It may or may not, right? Uh, so you always have to understand the details. But the problem with using reverse osmosis is that the water that comes through the drinking water tap has, you know, 1% or less of what is in the drinking water in terms of the contaminants. That's good. Uh, but then there's a portion of the water stream, the majority of it, about 70 or 80%, which it doesn't go through the membrane. And then now you've concentrated up these PFAS compounds and they go into the sewer and they go to the wastewater treatment plant and they're largely not removed. <clears throat> so you're taking them out of your drinking water, uh, but then you're putting them back in the environment. <clears throat> the flip side is the, the two sort of um, sorptive technologies, ion exchange and, and activated carbon, they physically, the, the molecules attach to these materials and the water is purified uh, to a very high degree. Uh, but now, in, in if you're a drinking water treatment plant and you're using activated carbon or ion exchange, you can't reuse those materials. You have to dispose of them as hazardous waste. Okay, And uh, you can regenerate carbon, but only if you have a thermal oxidizer, because the way we regenerate carbon is we expose it to really high temperature and that releases the PFAS compounds into the air. So unless you thermally oxidize them, destroy them and with a very expensive technology, it, these media just become hazardous waste. If you're in your home and once or twice a year, or four times a year, you're changing out your water filter and you're tossing it in the trash, now that ends up in the landfill. Eventually it degrades and breakdowns and the, these compounds get back out into the environment, either through the air or the water. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, you're, you're, you can protect yourself, you can give yourself, uh, you can decrease your exposure through drinking water, and even showers, you can get filters for your shower and things like that. So you can decrease your personal exposure. But in the end, what you're doing is you're transferring the problem from yourself to everyone else. And, and it's their persistence, these compounds of persistence, I think, which is one of the themes that I, I kept hearing throughout this conversation which is the driver for not being able to get rid of them. Yeah. Uh, maybe Elon Musk can send them into space to make it someone else's <laughs> problem. No, this is a really, we're at the end of our hour. If you can come on, stay on a little longer, that'd be good if we can discuss uh, just a little bit more on the solutions end here. To me, uh, there was another graph that's from the work that Carol's been involved with that I just want to show, which shows you the kind of that we're playing catch up here, which gets to Martin, the point of Martin's paper as well. Um, hold on. Just one out. It was very striking to see this. Uh, PFAS Health and Tech Talks uh, papers published each year, 1969 through 89 are not shown. And essentially this all started just 2007 people start saying, oh my God, there's something going on here. We need to get into it. Um, and you can see human animal in vitro. Early days still in terms of how that plays out into firm findings. But the, but if you, if I, I wish I could superimpose this on a graph showing the spread and ubiquity of these compounds over the same decades. And it's, it's clearly a game of catch up and that leaves the consumer, I mean, the homeowner, the, the parent in an arena where communication issues are crucial so that people aren't flailing around, losing sleep, uh, having sort of the equivalent of climate doom nightmares. Many kids are these days for the chemicals in the environment. I just see that David Ropik has just popped into the green room. David. Sorry to be. This is. No, I, I thought it'd be an interesting conversation to listen in on and chime in whenever. Hi. Well, we're, this is perfect because we're, we're at the end here. Is, you know, I really want to focus on my, my, my arena is communication and not just storytelling. How do we build, as was just said a minute ago, what, the tools, the databases, uh, mapping 
of these contaminated sites. But then the access to solutions as we work out those grand challenges about regulation seems really important. So David, maybe you could weigh in. You know, you've been writing about risk, communication, and the lack of response and the like for decades. So this is a, a, a precautionary principle challenge. You know, how do you communicate to the public about a risk where there's great uncertainty still? And advocates on one side who are stone cold convinced that it's the next big chemical, oh my God, uh, versus um, not the chemical industry, but a lot of the communications in that Ducatin paper that you just cited are equivocal. Uh, most of the public health agencies are they, they who have looked at which have looked at the um, the data on all of these chemicals, largely just a few, um, are equivocal. You know, there are hints. There's some evidence in a couple cases of, you know, uh, breastfeeding and a vaccine reaction, and uh, what was the other one, lipids being up, but a lot of the other evidence is equivocal. So. When there is no proof, that's why it's precautionary principle, how mm -hmm. do you caution people? There's another real problem, though, in this particular field, and I've only kind of followed it being retired now. Um, the threshold issue, uh, I think you sent around something, Andy, uh, earlier yeah. uh, to start this conversation about how what, what's some what's somebody supposed to do about a threshold that says four parts per gazillion is too high or right. some level that becomes inordinately expensive to really do anything about. You could filter your house to crazy levels and still not get down to that. Um, and so quite frankly, the, the risk communication challenge for this issue, I think, is for um, the agencies that are responsible for the safety of things like drinking water and food, the roots of exposure here, to uh, alert the public to the possibility to be honest about the equivocal nature of a lot of the evidence, to um, reassure that it's being closely watched. For example, I've been, I've been, I live in Concord, Massachusetts. So I've been kind of informally over coffee advising the public health board and what I and the, and the water uh, board because our threshold is just about to get uh, tripped. And what I've told them is the you don't you don't have the answers yet. You're waiting for all of those. A lot of those answers um, in cases where you think there's something actionable act. But in cases where you're not sure, make sure the public knows that you're paying close attention. You, on, on their behalf, you're paying close attention. It's a trust issue, really, uh, more than uh, information about the substances themselves. It's a trust issue. Also, um, one final note. So that was miscommunication from the public health agencies. So as you and Andy and I know, we both had, I was an environmental reporter for a long time. You guys, Garrett and Eric and Carol and Martin, hi, I haven't met you. I was a, an environmental reporter for 22 years. And at the beginning of my career, when I was young and I loved the alarm and I loved the, oh my God, and I love chemicals are bad and nuclear is bad and everything environmental is good. I just kind of fell in line. And then I kind of, if I may, grew up or got a little bit more cautious and skeptical because I started to see the advocacy about science on all sides, right? You know, scientific arguments posed as science, but really being advocacy. And I really think that PFAS, the, the family of these, is a huge challenge for the journalism community because you do have a lot of advocates, stone cold, absolutely convinced that all of the alarms are for real. And guess what? They're the ones who are, in my view of it, as I watch the media, are getting a lot of the attention. And their stuff gets simplified. The media doesn't like complications. The media doesn't like uncertainty. The media likes alarm. Uh, this is a, just the most recent and a very long list of standard media tropes about chemicals. This is, you know, add this to the long list of, we go back to DDT and pesticides and phthalates and all of those things where there were hints of harm and proof of harm in some cases, mm -hmm. but the complications and the complexities lost, right? right. So 
a huge challenge for environmental journalists. And I posted to a couple of places raising that alarm and had a couple of good conversations with Cheryl Hogue, uh, Chemical Chemistry News and uh, other places. But they're they're down in the down in the deep end of screaming. This is the biggest boogeyman ever. And and, yeah. and that it's running into a culture problem with journalism too. the the um, un, the equivocal nature of what we know. Sorry, long. Well, yeah, yeah, no, this is valuable. And the thing that I think, I, I think Mich Michigan Live gets at this. And Carol, I'll get you in in a second. Um, journalists historically have focused on stories as the product. Like this, you know, unfortunately, this one with a terrible headline. When the product can as easily be a, a map, an interactive map. ProPublica, many journalists have come into this space not trying to alarm people, but trying to uh, to arm, trying to arm people as opposed to alarm them. And, and I assume, uh, you know, Michigan Live would be a place where that could happen too. But Carol, um, let's get you in. I just wanted to add a, a quick sentence. Two irrefutable facts. I agree that it's complicated and we don't know everything about everything for sure. But there are two things that are irrefutable. One is that all PFAS are persistent. They don't break down or they break down into some other PFAS. And the second is that we are continuing every single day to put more and more and more PFAS into the environment because we are still continuing to make these products and they're consumer products are not just industrial processes. So, you know, there's no arguing those points. You can't blow them out of proportion, I don't think. That's true. I, I would support or second that and agree that, that that this is and this is just wrong to keep going with this knowing that there are persistence and persistent won't go away is is irresponsible and i would say also perhaps to, to, because i agree david this is a, a challenge for communication for journalism uh, i think this is not just a glitch in 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 a stream of normal life and normal operation this is really a planetary boundary and this is something has because it's not just a global uh, i'm sorry a local or a national problem in a certain in some country it's a problem everywhere in the world and that is really important make it different from something that is more or less a local spill of something that's bad enough but it's 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 limited to a certain community and it has to be handled by the regulators in in that area but no, here we have something that is totally different because it really is global and it affects everyone and it indicates a boundary and these boundaries that we are talking about now may be reconnected to the limits, the limits to growth that were invoked 50 years ago. So we are really hitting the wall in some way here. And that is some, a message that I think be connected to this problem of chemical risk, because this goes beyond just chemical risk. Oh, I think that's true. Uh, and, and let's just do a last round here. And, and uh, well, I just want yes. to echo what Martin said and, and also challenge a little bit, David, apologies, we don't know each other, but um, you, you've, you've lived through, you know, every so many years, there's, an, there's another, you know, uh, pollutant uh, of the week, so to speak. Uh, however, there are very few that are global issues like this. I mean, there's, there's CO2 in the atmosphere and climate change. There were the, the CFCs back in the 70s and 80s. And, and you know, hydrocarbon contamination in, in groundwater is very localized. And it does transport, but you know, a polluter in, in the state of Michigan is not going to impact Antarctica in terms of a, a chemical release. So I, I think this is a bigger issue in terms of exposure, in terms of persistence. I think there are many, many questions and unknowns about the health effects and safe levels of exposure. Um, but I just think it's it is a much bigger issue. And so sorry, uh, but I wanted to throw that out there. No, I think that's this this is a really important point. And I think um, I'll be doing more than one session on this issue because these conversations are always iterative. Uh, everyone, every one of them leads to some key points. One would be, you know, is the POPs treaty applicable here further? You know, what can be done at the level of there's a plastics treaty now being negotiated for the first time. Uh, but I'll tell you one important thing about that plastics treaty is that there's a big chunk of the plastics industry, you know, not everyone, who are engaged in such a, a way that there's a lot of overlap I see as a journalist between what the plastics folks are saying and what Greenpeace is saying. So that feels, it feels like maybe there's something to do there. In the United States in 1980, there was this entity created called the Health Effects Institute to look 
uh, in an unbiased way at um, air pollution. Uh, it's you know, 50 or so years old. David probably knows tons more about it than oh, I do. Oh, I know who runs it, and it was it was the police. It was it was the mediator. They both parties who couldn't agree about this was right. back to the beginning of the precautionary principle discussion. You know, the, the chemistry industry was saying until you have proof, you can't regulate it. Right. And the precautionary people were saying until we have proof that it's safe, you can't use it. And they created this thing around air pollution. They are the mediating science body, widely respected. And yes, it's starting with these other issues. And by the way, Andy, pardon my. Yeah, but we have a history of helping them moving towards resolving the mm -hmm. kind of cross boundary. I won't say global, but cross boundary issues. We did it with acid rain, right? The stuff that sure. comes out of Ohio is bad in New York. We've started to do it with mercury. You know, the stuff that comes out of Ohio was bad in the ocean and people in California eat it. We did it with PCBs and an issue there was their persistence. So there, there is a record of taking these on. Um, yeah. A little too slow, but there is a record, and we sh and and a lot of the players in this, I think, recognize that that's a more productive way to go than fighting it out. Sorry, my uh, I'm in Maine, and the internet is funny. No, no, I th I think so. One thing I want to drive forward with, and and is can I get Carol, in your organization, and uh, you know folks like. Eric at UCLA and, and even Martin internationally, is there a way to convene? And maybe it does take someone to have to knock heads, as David said, in that case, it was uh, uh, litigation regulation, industry was brought to the table. Is there a way to move beyond dueling press releases, which is what this, like this, to me, this is just completely irresponsible for the industry to just say, oh no, this is, this is a new technology, flora technology, it's part of, it enables life in the 21st century. Come on. Well, please. plastics, life would be... It's, it's, no, no, I, it just... It would be it, impossible, it, right? It immediately yeah. brought me back. So that's ridiculous. But I'm hoping we can somehow figure out, is there a Health Effects Institute way forward for these kinds of issues? Garrett, uh, and, and then we're going to do a chapter two sometime. Um, I, you know, what David said earlier about the challenge for journalism, um, you know, I, I totally... I feel him on that um, because, you know, you have to, I, I think there's something to be learned from the, the way journalism handled climate change uh, and, and the way it, in, in handling this. Um, and that's something that I had to kind of come to grips with myself several years ago. And you have, you know, this thing and there's all kinds of, you know, quibbles around how bad it is. And you have industry on one side, you have the polluter saying something, and then you have, uh, you know, independent experts saying something else. And you have to kind of find someone as a journalist, you know, you have to find someone who you trust, uh, who's not part of it to give you some sort of like, okay, this is sort of, you lay it out for me here. And then it's really this, this idea, I think, where, yeah, that, that thing from the American Chemistry Council, you know, that Martin sort of referred to as propaganda, it's, it's not, <laughs> I think that's sort of almost a responsible way to look at it, right? I mean, there is, you know, it, journalism's role here is to look at that stuff skeptically. Um, and so my, my view here is, is frankly that, you know, the, the model that that's sort of been adopted here, uh, increasingly by journalism, that climate change is real. Let's go move forward from there. You know, PFAS are harmful. Let's move forward from there. That sort mm -hmm. of seems to, that was sort of my baseline, uh, you know, and I think that's a helpful baseline and I've encouraged other journalists, you know, who I've spoken to, to kind of attack it from that way. Um, what I think does happen is, unfortunately, due to the nature of, you know, declining ranks in, in journalism in general, you get a lot of non-experts, non-expertise, uh, non-science, you know, uh, knowledgeable reporters who get thrown into this story and they don't have the sourcing to be able to really understand it. And, you know, that results in bad journalism. And I've definitely seen plenty of that in Michigan, you know, covering local community issues. And, you know, you see a, the, the, the TV reporter from Channel Whatever does something where they're totally mixing up the acronyms and you're just kind of like face palming when you read and you watch the story, you know, to try and get away from that as much of that as possible. 
It's going to really require a lot of digestion by reporters at the national level uh, to, 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 to sort of pre-digest a lot of this stuff. So when it gets down to reporters at the very local level, because they're, they're taking a lot of their cues and they're, they need to, you know, they're, they're looking for sources in those national stories in order to, to help them understand and, and localize something. And so, you know, but to get back to what I was saying, I think, you know, if we start from the idea that this stuff is harmful, um, that's really sort of like a good baseline, I think, for journalists to move forward with. Well, I, uh, I thank you so much all for being here today. Martin Schrodinger, particularly you, given that it's like dinner time there. I don't know if you have family who are putting up with your being on your computer. Uh, but Martin Scheringer from the ETH Zurich, uh, author of the, the new paper, setting the uh, PFAS question in global context. You know, it's, 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 as we were saying by email, it's kind of like the layers we're putting down into the sediment through the Anthropocene, our carbon impact. But here it's in our bodies, it's, it's everywhere, this, this, this forcing um, with uncertainty, but certainty. And the, the role of journalism, the role of better conversations between journalists and scientists is critical. Carol, uh, great to have you here today, Carol Kwiatkowski. Uh, uh, Okay. Uh, I don't know why my camera keeps quitting on me, uh, but we'll cut to the chase then. Thank you for being here, everyone. And let's do this again. I'm, I'm going to try to push forward on a couple of these, these lines of inquiry. Uh, and I think it's, it's just great to have this conversation. I am also going to do a watchword segment and a post on the word safe. <laughs> oh, my God. Getting clarity on this, I think getting away from this. I in suppose a way, we could do something to avoid dead air. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, when an issue is like this, he if, must if be on his way back. You know, I was going to mention something that I, I could say here very quickly. I like the, the proposal of the question sustain what? I think it's really important. And I think that people haven't. Hi, Andy. I just started speaking in your absence so that we didn't have. Sorry. Questions dead space there i'm really glad you did no no keep, you can keep going uh, to me the finding ways to facilitate in journalism and in, in consumers of information in in agencies to think less about storytelling and more about uh, information sharing and, and concern sharing and building because that's where the trust comes from or the distrust in the opposite and that's where you can reveal this uh, you know things that are not true and being propagated. I think having a conversation around the word safe and the word unsafe, I think is really a valuable thing to do going forward. And I'll be doing that as well. And I just want to close, you know, back in 2010, 2008, through that N. Haynes work, you know, blood, t blood samples all around the country in the United States were being looked at for these increasingly tiny traces of things. I came up with this headline and I kind of like it. It's sort of not a palindrome. I don't know what it is. We are what we drink is what we are. It actually is two headlines in one. We are what we drink. And what we drink is what we are now. And like with the climate, we are part of the climate system now. Finding a way forward that's safer, especially for those most vulnerable, whether it's in the climate changing or in our, our, the chemosphere is an essential part of these coming years. So thank you again all for being here today. Sorry about my disappearing act periodically, but you've, you've been great. And there's much more. Oh, and I wanted to end with a note of humor. <laughs> I, I, I reached out to the artist, the cartoonist. I saw this on Daily Cost and I asked him if to have, we could have permission to show it on the show. Lalo Alcaraz. He's, he's a very prominent cartoonist and his, his takeaway was nice planet, but don't drink the rainwater. <laughs> Which, if that if that can be linked to as a way to engage people on bigger questions, I think is plays a very important role as well. So thanks, Lalo. This is the uh, Columbia Climate School Sustain What webcast. Uh, I'll be writing this up for my Sustain What bulletin. Uh, look at that little scrolling bar to get information on how to. Uh, whoops! And there we go. And <laughs> uh, oh, oh my God. I'm, all right. So anyway, goodbye, good night, good day, and good morning. <laughs> and be well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. That was wacky. I haven't had that camera problem. <laughs>